Walsley from the Beyond Nuclear Initiative. I'm not even going to talk anymore about that, but she will go on um, and introduce you all. For anyone who doesn't know where, how to find Natalie, please Google Beyond Nuclear Initiative. Get behind that campaign because uranium exploration has been opened up. Thank you, and I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on today and that sovereignty over this land never ceded. It's really great to see people from such a diverse range of community groups here to challenge Barry O'Farrell's agenda of systematically trashing the environment and the laws that protect it. So I'm really glad to be here with you today. I um, coordinate the Beyond Nuclear Initiative, which is a national project, and I'm part of a community group called Uranium Free New South Wales, which formed in response to the O'Farrell government overturning a 26-year bipartisan ban on uranium exploration in New South Wales that happened earlier this year. It was a long-standing, sensible and bipartisan ban and Barry O'Farrell did not take this to people before the election like so many of the issues we're covering here today. There is no mandate, there is no so social licence to take New South Wales down the yellow cake road. There is a human cost and an environmental cost to the uranium industry. The move to put uranium exploration on the agenda in New South Wales is strongly opposed immediately and quickly by a range of environment groups, health professionals, trade unions, the Greens and the Labor opposition. The coalitions come together strongly and developed a New South Wales Uranium Free Charter. Please look that up and if your organisation wants to join on, we really encourage more organisations to join the Uranium Free Charter for New South Wales. I want to clear up a couple of facts. You hear often saying that there's a lot of jobs in the uranium industry. This is just not true. Across the whole country, there's less than 2,000 jobs in uranium exploration, uranium mining and uranium processing. Opening up New South Wales is not going to be a big boom for this industry. They say that there's a lot of economics in the uranium industry as well. It's currently less than one third of 1% of Australia's export revenue. It hovers around the levels of our industrial salt and our cheese exports. This is not an industry going places. In fact, since the Fukushima accident, this is an industry going backwards, where countries around the world are winding back, winding back their use of nuclear power and stepping forward and looking to clean energy future, which is what we want for New South Wales, not the dirty, dinosaur, toxic industry that is uranium. The Australian government has admitted, has admitted that uranium from Australia was present in all of the nuclear reactors at Fukushima that were stricken. Now that's something we have a responsibility now to step up and say no more uranium coming out of the ground, no more uranium being sent overseas for another Fukushima or another Three Mile Island or another Chernobyl because it could happen. What the uranium industry does do is create uranium tailings that need to be managed for hundreds of thousands of years. It creates nuclear waste of which there is currently no high level nuclear waste dump anywhere in the world. There is no solution to isolate these tailings or waste from the environment and people for the length of time that they are radioactive. It does fuel nuclear proliferation and Barry O'Farrell explicitly said one of the reasons they're opening up New South Wales is to sell uranium to India, which is not a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. If Australia steps across that line, then it's saying we can sell uranium to other countries who haven't signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and it snowballs from there. What the uranium industry does do is it dislocates people, it displaces people, whether through poisoning their country or through policy that puts up fences and locks traditional owners out of their traditional cultural places, stops people being able to live in their communities, and as we see with Fukushima and Chernobyl, keeps people away from places where they grew up and have connection to potentially forever. Forever. The federal government is looking short-term, short-sighted and short potential profits. We need to think long-term, beyond when Barry O'Farrell and his government are gone from this building, beyond when Barry O'Farrell is gone from this planet, those radioactive waste tailings are going to be dangerous. And that's not the sort of future we want to leave for people in New South Wales or anywhere in Australia. Why did they not overturn the ban on uranium mining? because they know that this is deeply unpopular. So we have the opportunity now to make sure that that uranium stays in the ground. And if there is a push for uranium mining, we need everybody to stand up and say, at the very minimum, we need an inquiry into this industry across Australia. Because once the facts are on the table, it's just not going to stack up. We do want jobs for regional New South Wales. We want jobs that are safe and we want jobs that are sustainable for the environment. We don't want workers at uranium sites handling radioactive materials, transporting radioactive materials. 
We don't want the risk to their families and to the children. We don't want the risk to the environment for contamination of waters and all those beautiful places where we like to go and see. So I want to encourage you again to join us in the Uranium Free New South Wales campaign. BHP Billiton is having their AGM tomorrow and we're going to be outside that AGM to say no coal and no uranium in New South Wales. It's at the Convention Centre at 10.30. Please come along and join us. Come and have a chat if you want to get involved in the campaign and let's keep the environment clean for our future generations. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm pleased to join with my parliamentary colleagues Alex Greenwich and David Shoebridge in speaking today as members of the State Parliament committed to environmental protection and committed to resisting the O'Farrell government's relentless attacks on environmental protection. There's one group of workers who are here today who I want to single out and acknowledge because their fight is worthy of the support of all of us. That's the workers from the Cronulla Fisheries Research Centre. Kevin, Kevin Evans spoke earlier about marine conservation and one of the very first decisions of this government was to place a moratorium on marine parks. On what basis? They said they'd be guided by the science rather than politics when it comes to decisions regarding marine parks. Then of course, only three months later, they moved to gut the world-class research centre at Cronulla. The scientists who do the work on marine conservation. They said they were committed to the science, but then we see a decision without any cost-benefit analysis to gut that centre. Now, a cross-party committee, including people of the like of the Reverend Fred Nile, have condemned the government for that decision and called on them to reverse it. Reverend Nile's called on the government to halt the current relocation while the government considers the report of the cross-party parliamentary committee. And we had our voice today in saying to Mr O'Farrell and his government, reverse the decision to close the Cronulla Fisheries Research Centre. Yeah. Friends, a couple of Fridays ago marked the 30th anniversary of the historic decision of Neville Rand's government to save the rainforests of North East New South Wales. And Neville Rand today is not the man he once was. He's very sick. But Neville Rand sent a message the other week on that anniversary acknowledging the thanks of so many people in the environmental movement who, who marked that anniversary. And I've been to the Nightcap National Park. The North East Forests saved, the rainforest saved 30 years ago, the protected estate built through the Rand and Carr years under attack today by members of the government, members of the national parties, liberal parties and shooters and fishers parties who want to hand back parts of the national park estate in northeast New South Wales to the timber industry. They also want to hand back parts of the Pilliga where I've been, parts of the River Redgum Forest where I've been, hand them back to the timber industry. What I think we've seen in recent decades is an acceptance by the community and a community support for nature conservation, for building one of the world's leading networks of conservation reserves. And of course, it's always been the NPA for decades and many other environmental groups that are represented here today that have put those issues, those struggles, before politicians, before governments, and forced action on nature conservation. We now have a systemic attack on our national park system, on our network of conservation reserves to hand back areas to the loggers. This is a government who in its five point plan went to the election promising, and I quote, protect our local environment. 
point five in their five point plan that reveals itself each and every week to be relentlessly hostile to environmental protection. And if you think things are bad today, the 12 points on the list that the NPA sent out, imagine if they reversed the protections of the River Redgum Forest, or the Pilliga, or the North East Forest. Imagine how bad things will be then. So today we commit to building the campaign. I'm happy to join with Greens Party and independent politicians in the New South Wales Parliament to form common cause to argue for environmental protection. State Labor is proud of the record, particularly in building that national park system. And all of us today commit to building the community opposition to the O'Farrell government's winding back of environmental protections, the O'Farrell government's assault on environmental protections in this state. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Drew Hutton. I'm the president of the Lafayette Alliance. Yeah. Coal and coal seam gas have no role to play, no constructive role to play in a clean energy future for New South Wales or Australia. Coal and coal seam gas have nothing but a destructive role to play in the sustainable development of New South Wales and the rest of the country. Why then, why then, are governments all around this country, including this one here, the O'Farrell government in New South Wales, why are they going to all sorts of trouble to ensure the profitability, the continuation, the dominance of the whole resources sector over the rest of the economy and to the detriment of the people who are affected by it, directly impacted by it? That is a very good question to ask. One of the enduring images of the last New South Wales state election campaign was Barry O'Farrell, Chris Harcher, Brad Hazard and a couple of other soon-to-be ministers standing in red shirts all together looking a bit sheepish and on the front of their red shirts is water not coal. Water not coal. Well, it's an image which has come back to haunt them because they have reversed the priorities on that shirt 100% since then. It is now very much about coal and about coal seam gas and it is not about water, it is not about the environment, it's not about our good farmland, it's not about the health and, and, and um, amenity of our local communities, it is about the mining and gas industry and how profitable they can be. And this is, a, this is a tragedy because before the last election they didn't just get out in red shirts with funny slogans on, they promised us that we would have a strategic regional land use plan which would protect our good farmland and which would protect our important environmental areas. They also said that they would introduce policies which would ensure that our precious underground water systems in the driest continent on earth would also be protected. So what did they do when they came to power? They certainly introduced a strategic land use policy, but it's a policy that simply gives open slather to these industries. Instead of, instead of saying, this is an important wine growing area, this is a really important productive agricultural area. This is a really important environmental area, high conservation value area. You can't go there, industry, they're protected. Oh no, they set up what they call the gateway process. A gateway process that, that all of these mining proposals would have to go through in order to be approved. Well, the problem with their gateway process is it doesn't have a bloody gate. It doesn't have a gate. You just walk through. The only places that they can't go in this state are national parks. They can go anywhere they like. Not only that, but they introduced an aquifer interference policy. They said that they would, um, uh, they would protect their underground water. Well, that aquifer interference policy 
the problem with that is it's just a policy. It's not too bad. There are some good parts in it. It's just a policy. It's not a regulation. You don't have to abide by it. It's just a helpful set of guidelines. They have simply opened up the gates and allowed this industry open slather at some of the most important assets in this state. And that's, that's shameful. Now, there's only one thing, there's only one thing which has stopped the resource industries from simply marching across the New South Wales landscape wherever they want to go, despoiling whatever areas they want to and wrecking whatever natural resources that they uh, happen to, that they happen to be collateral damage along the way. And that is the landowners in this state and their supporters who have locked a gate on these companies. And there's a very good reason that that's been done. It started up in my home state of Queensland a couple of years ago out of pure desperation. And what happens when you're in that state is you've lost your seat at the table. You can't go to government and put a rational argument to them about why this should not be done because they are completely in favour of your opposition. You've got no more leverage. So what do you do in that situation? Well, let me tell you, folks, the first thing you have to do is stop talking to yourselves. And you've got to go out and start talking to other people in the community. And you've got to get mobilised. And you've got to start talking to people that you've never spoken to before in your lives. And that's where the Lock the Gate movement was born. We decided that rather than just simply rolling over or going through the accepted processes, environmental impact assessment, you know, the, the petitioning the, the government, polite letters of submission and so on, that we, and lobbying, that we would go and mobilise the community. Not only mobilise them, but we would encourage them to resist. And that's what they've done. They have refused to allow these companies access to their land until governments bring in the necessary protections. And that's, that has involved courageous action on their part. That's involved courage. That's a brave act. In New South Wales, it is civil disobedience to refuse to allow these companies onto your land. You can go to jail. You can get a huge fine. But you know what? They can't take 10 to 15,000 landowners in New South Wales to court. They can't do it. And they won't do it. Now, Gandhi once said that 100,000 Englishmen can't control 400 million Indians if those 400 million don't want to be controlled. Well, that's the same situation that we've got in rural New South Wales. Chris Harcher can issue as many coal seam gas licences as he likes. He can, he can give mates coal exploration licences as many as he likes. But he can't get onto that land and neither can the companies because those gates are locked and the landowners are keeping them locked. And communities are coming in behind those landowners and giving them support. In the Northern Rivers, 87% of the people of the Lismore local authority area voted no to coal seam gas. Every one of the, the councils in these areas, whether you're talking about the Hunter, whether you're talking about the Northern Rivers, whether you're talking about the Southern Highlands, councils are coming together and supporting their communities, supporting their landowners and saying, no, enough is enough. We are not allowing these companies onto, onto this land and we're going to support landowners in our attempt to stop that from happening. This is a people's movement like nothing we've seen before. It's bringing together people who have never worked together before. I, I called it once the, the cockies, blockies, croppers and greenies movement. Uh, but it, that, that doesn't even get, give credit to it. It's much wider than that. It's everybody. We've got now uh, two blockades going in this state. I don't know if you know that, but there's one up at Glenoogie uh, near Grafton uh, where uh, local people have blockaded Metgasco from coming onto a property and setting up their drill rigs. Go on them. 
down in the southern highlands at Sutton Forest. Um, the, uh, a blockade has been set up there to stop POSCO, a South Korean multinational uh, mining corporation from coming in and setting up a coal mine there. Beautiful country, absolutely beautiful country. Um, it's the first blockade I've ever been to, I might add, where I got served French champagne. Good old Southern Highlands, that's the place to go. Better in Queensland, you just get mice running all over in the middle of a mice plague in their blockades. But these are ordinary Australians who have never broken the law in their lives. And they're committing civil disobedience, peaceful, direct action, in order to protect this land. It is not a NIMBY campaign. This is not just simply a farmer's campaign to protect their little bit of property. This is a huge national movement with enormous national significance. We are in the last few decades of the fossil fuel era. Now that's got nothing to do with us. It's just going to happen because the resources are running out. And in order to get uh, more fossil fuel resources, they have to resort to more and more dangerous and, and high impact activities like coal seam gas. So we're in the last few decades of that, but like some mythological beast, this industry is going to lash out, and when it does, it will take whole regions with it. And the only thing that we can do to stop that is to have a people's movement, a people's movement, a whole national movement, people in the city, people in the country, farmers, environmentalists, young and old, who come together and say, this is the future of our country that's at stake here. We want a clean energy future. We want a sustainably developed country. Our country held to ransom by resource industries that got 10 or 20 years of life, profits for their shareholders, and a ravaged earth left behind them. That is not what we want as a society, and we must fight as hard as we can to stop that happening. Thank you. A great example came through today of what people can do to help change. It's not over yet, but the T4 people fighting the Terminal 4 in Newcastle have an announcement today that PWCS, their, ex, their fourth coal owner, has gone from this down to this because they're having an impact. We've got two years until the 2015 election in March. Um, it's, we can either sit back and wait for, wait for more onslaught to happen or we can just mount a campaign two years out now, going for no vote for Barry Farrell. Barry O'Farrell's got to go. Our environment is not safe under him in any way, shape or form. We've seen so much indication of that, it's crazy. Turn your attention to, to a no vote, no Barry. Um, campaign right now. Let's start it today. Thank you all for your patience. I notice that this is a wonderful um, um, spread of people from so many parts of parts of New South Wales and thank you for all travelling. Have a great Christmas. Take stock, take a rest and we'll see you next year.